You can listen again to any shows at bcfmradio.com and leave comments about your favorite programs. BCFM 93.2, your interactive station, 24 hours a day. I'm joined now by the new master of the Merchant Ventures. That is Chris Curling. I announced you at the top of the hour, Chris, um, saying that Bristol Merchants originally discovered America, but that was before the Merchant Ventures were formed, I believe. Yeah, it was um, the best part of 70 or 80 years before we were formed. Although uh, it is fair to say that uh, there were predecessor bodies uh, to the Merchant Ventures who were around at that time, and indeed well before 1497. Uh, who were um, involved in, uh, in in all sorts of uh, uh, different things, uh, l- 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 and, and, and the Cabot um, expedition is an example of those. Now, uh, what about uh, the controversy recently, though? Because we had um, we had the uh, Bishop of Bristol, Mike Hill, giving a, a speech to you and some of your um, children at your various schools that you're in charge of. Um, I think it was uh, Colson Girls School and the Merchants Academy, where he was throwing into question this whole business of Edward Colston, the former merchant venturer, and his involvement in the slave trade, saying that actually uh, his business dealings, the questions over his de- business dealings were speculation. Now, is that something you'd go along with as well? Well, I was, uh, as you say, at that service, and uh, what I heard the bishop say was that um, there was speculation around the morality of Colston's business dealings, uh, or some of them anyway. Uh, he did not, the bishop did not mention slavery in in what he said. Um, but if you're asking me the question, do I think that uh, Colston um, w- w- would have been involved in slavery, uh, I would have to say that it was more than likely. Um, as it happens... Uh, his uh, family business, which he inherited, was based around the import of uh, of wine, uh, oil, and fruit from Spain and Mediterranean countries. But I I, I think that there are um, various bits of circumstantial evidence which would suggest, although not proved, but would suggest that he probably had some involvement in the in the slave trade, which of course at that time uh, was legal and not even regarded as immoral. I mean, seems, it seems extraordinary today that that would be the case because, of course, we all regard slavery as utterly abhorrent. But uh, th- that was the way it was at the time. Well, in, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a report out in the newspapers, London newspapers here, about modern slavery in Britain, saying they reckon that there's 30,000 people still involved in modern slavery in Britain. Uh, in Britain, that is absolutely right, and um, uh, we, this is we know people, people trafficking. This yeah, kind of thing. And, and we know that there are several hundred of those um, in and around Bristol. Uh, and I heard on the radio the other day that the, uh, the, the 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 current level of trade in modern slavery worldwide produces an annual profit, an annual profit of a one hundred and fifty billion pounds a year. It is a massive problem and a massive issue uh, these days, not least right here in our backyard in Bristol. Okay, so the Merchants Venture has actually got their, you got your uh, charter back in 1552, but doing a bit of research into you, looking at the articles that Rich Cookson did back about 10 years ago, uh, looking at power in the city, um, one of the things he found out was that um, the Merchant Ventures don't have to file for the for the Merchant Ventures themselves accounts at companies' house. But although there are some f- uh, accounts filed, um, they are for subsidiary companies of the Merchant Ventures. So it seems like a bit of a mysterious organisation. How much money do the Merchant Ventures really have, and what are your investments? We are far less wealthy than would be commonly assumed. And the reason for that is that we uh, have responsibility for a number of trusts, two or three of which are really very significant. That is not our money, but it is, it is money, it is, it is capital, which the Society of Merchant Ventures manages for very specific causes. Uh, we have a charitable fund of our own, uh, which gives out into the local community about £250,000 a year. Uh, and, in fact, over the last uh, five years, we have given money uh, to something like 150 different uh, local charitable activities 
around the greater Bristol region. But you can see why people question this whole thing that, that George Ferguson, the former merchant venturer, now the mayor, uh, was saying about that, oh, the merchant venturers, they put far more into the city than they take out. If you're not absolutely open about what those investments are, people are going to start asking questions, aren't they? I mean, like me, for example, about where those investments, I mean, for example, in oil, in the oil industry. I mean, I know he found that you had a lot of shares in, in um, Shell Oil, for example, uh, other utility companies, banks, that kind of thing. People start to ask, well, hang on a minute, uh, every time I fill up my petrol tank, a little bit of money's going to the merchant venturers. Every time I pay my water bill, a little bit of money's going to the merchant venturers. And I know you're also a director, one of the directors of Bristol Water. So uh, electricity as well. Do you have finance? Uh, do you have investments in there? Well, if you if we had uh, uh, no investments in any of that list of uh, of sectors that you've mentioned, uh, I'm not quite sure where we would end up. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm an environmental campaigner. I would not myself. Uh, want to have shares in in certain sectors, um, but uh, but 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 the reality is that um, uh, if you're saying that one shouldn't have shares in banks and and uh, one shouldn't have shares in electricity companies, uh, I, I I must say I find that a a, a pretty odd proposition. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is, uh, for example, if I've got, uh, I mean, it's about the rich and the poor, really, is what I'm saying. Is say, for example, if I've got £20,000 to invest, say, for example, in, uh, uh, I don't know, Northwest Water or Southern Electricity or whatever, then I can easily find that, that my share dividends will just pay my bills forever and I've got a nice little nest egg. So effectively what's happening is people who are wealthy are simply not paying any bills, but well, that, that those who are poor are paying that, for them. That, that proposition assumes that in some rather bizarre way, uh, the Society of Merchant Venturers or its members personally are benefiting from these investments. But as I have just told you, uh, we are giving the income from uh, this, uh, the, 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 this endowment that we have uh, to uh, the charitable causes right throughout the city. Uh, how you can argue that that is the rich sort of keeping for the rich, goodness only knows. Well, I mean, are most, aren't most of the Merchant Venturers, if not all of them, all independently wealthy anyway? Uh, no, that is not the case. Uh, they, 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 the, the, the merchant venturers are a group of about 75 people who are drawn mainly from across the business and indeed the wider community. Uh, but uh, And some of them, of course, are wealthy. Some of them have been very successful in business and have, have done extremely well. Um, but that is not uh, uh, right across the piece by any means. And what about arms firms? Do you invest in arms firms or not? In what? Arms firms. Arms companies. Uh, I, I, not, not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, I, but I, I wouldn't be able to answer that specifically. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm surely sure. as the master, you've got some kind of knowledge of which shares that the, the merchants are investing what, what, in. What I, what I am uh, concerned about and engaged in as master uh, is the pursuit of the various um, activities that the society is engaged in for the benefit of the wider community. And that is, uh, frankly, a, 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 a broad spectrum which ranges from, um, uh, from, from, from concern with youth and young people in our extensive education activity uh, through to the community funding that I've already mentioned, through to social business and uh, social enterprise, uh, we, 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 which we're supporting, and then particularly uh, into the care of the elderly uh, for the, through the work which we do uh, in looking after directly and indirectly some 1,500 uh, elderly people in this city who need different types of, uh, of, of care, whether it be the most likely sheltered or, or right through to, uh, to, to, to state-of-the-art dementia units. So are you saying effectively that where the cuts are biting, um, that the LibCon Alliance nationally is, is forcing local authorities to roll back things like elderly care, youth work, that the merchant ventures are taking over? Uh, we are we are, are are doing our bit to help. I, I, I see that you have a smile on your face, uh, and I think that that is an entirely uh, appropriate reaction to your own question. Uh, so you're doing some work, but are you able to actually do any more? Because a lot of people are w looking around the city when, I mean, for example, there's a, um, a respite care centre called the Bush Residential Care Home, which the um, local authority is having to actually cut back, halving the amount of care they're able to give there. Are people like the merchants able to uh, pick up the ball and run with it? Well, uh, we, we are doing that, and we're, and, and we're doing what we can. And I think the thrust of your question is absolutely right, that there is massive need out there. And um, the Society of Merchant Venturers today 
uh, is a group of 75 people who I would have to say I would describe as, uh, as, as, as can-do people in the main, uh, who are doing what they can to address a set of what you rightly describe as very big issues. So what, what's your analysis of the sort of macroeconomics here? Because we're looking at a situation back in 2008. We had a massive bailout for the banks, didn't we? Some of which you may have shares in. Uh, and many would say, actually, what we should have done was to just let those banks go bust. And then the public would not have spent £750 billion pounds keeping them going when they're effectively, uh, you know, a lot of people would say zombie banks. Do you think that that, that, that was the right decision to make back in 2008, the bailout? Um, uh, well, this, this, that's a question that, of course, has nothing to do with the merchant ventures whatsoever. So you're asking for my personal yeah. uh, opinion on that. Uh, and I think that it is uh, a, 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 a moot point uh, as to whether the uh, policy was, that was adopted at that time, uh, which extends not only to the bailing out of the banks, but also, of course, to this massive quantitative easing, uh, that has uh, that has then um, been conducted by the Bank of England subsequently. I think it's a moot point as to whether that was um, uh, a, a, an appropriate policy. What, of course, we don't know is what the negative impacts would have been uh, from taking an alternative course of action. And the argument at the time, uh, and I'm not an economist, so I, I, I'm, I'm not in a position to make an informed view about it, but the argument at the time was that um, by failing to bail out the banks, uh, we would have uh, caused much greater um, social unrest and social discomfort. It certainly people. would have been a lot of discomfort, but, I mean, it probably would have hit rich people more than it would have hit poor people because there's a, uh, you know, those who've got, obviously got shares in the banks would have lost their money. But there's a sort of a bigger principle here in a way, isn't it? It's it, quite clearly looking at those banks at the time, back in 2008, and possibly now still, there are questions saying, well, hang on a minute, uh, they're not actually running a viable business. Should we, the public, help them? Or should we just allow that business to take its course. It's almost like, I suppose, a free market argument. The too big to fail uh, argument is um, an awful one. And I, and I would have thought that few people would these days um, want to um, support and condone that argument. And indeed, uh, a lot of steps have been taken by, um, by, by authorities uh, to try to address that very issue uh, should it arise again. Um, and uh, as I say, I, 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 I think there would be few people who would want to uh, embrace the too big to fail policy. What about the too big to jail policy? Because a lot of people uh, are saying that, that a lot of these banks, I mean, they've been doing things like money laundering, fixing the foreign exchange rates. No, none of the senior people in the, any of these banks have been arrested, prosecuted or anything like that. It's all been out of court fines. What, what are your thoughts about whether that's appropriate? Uh, I, I per, again, it's a, this is purely a personal view and we're, we're now a million miles from the Society of Merchant Venturers or indeed from any of the other activities in which I'm engaged. But um, if, you, if you want to pursue this, uh, this line of I argument, do, yeah. I, I, um, I would very <laughs> much agree that, um, that, that, that uh, it seems extremely odd uh, that uh, individuals can be uh, prosecuted and sent to jail for uh, offences which one might legitimately say are far less in their uh, intensity uh, and severity of impact uh, than what some of the, the bankers have been involved in. So would you agree with that phrase, too big to jail? Do you think they were too big to jail? I don't know whether they were too big to jail, but I, 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 I suppose I find it quite surprising that people haven't uh, taken action against, um, or don't seem to have been able to take action uh, against some of these individuals. Yes, maybe we put, put another call into the City of London Police. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, back to you, Chris. Tell us a bit about you uh, as the um, master of the Merchant Ventures. What are your other roles and where have you come to or come from to the merchants? OK. Um, I, uh, was, I'm an Essex boy, actually, by background. Uh, and uh, I hitchhiked down here with my wife uh, in 1974 to seek my fortune in the West Country. And just to be clear, I'm still seeking it. So um, in, in relation to your earlier comments. And um, uh, I came down here and uh, I joined a firm uh, of, uh, of lawyers, a small firm of lawyers. Uh, and we built up that firm 
uh, from about 40 or 50 when I joined it to a point where 25 years later it had 800 people. Uh, I was a corporate finance lawyer and uh, we became a corporate uh, firm. We actually engaged in during, during that 25-year period in quite a lot of what you might laughingly describe as uh, entrepreneurial activity, which you don't necessarily associate with lawyers. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, there was, uh, there was a bit of uh, enterprise in that. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I retired from that firm uh, 10 years ago, having um, been one of two people running it for 15 years, uh, we had 800 uh, employees and we had offices not only in Bristol but in London, uh, in Germany, in Scandinavia, in Silicon Valley and all over the place. Crikey, who were they then? Uh, Osmond Clark. Oh, Okay. Um, and so you say you retired, but you're obviously quite active still, aren't yeah. you? What, what, well, what, I, 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 I retired at the age of, uh, of, of 53 uh, <laughs> in, or, in order to pursue a series of business <laughs> interests that, uh, that I'd been developing in the previous uh, few years. So uh, to cut a long story short, I'm now the chairman of a small public company based in Milton Keynes, uh, which is uh, in the employee benefits business. Uh, I'm well, an, sorry, just who are they? Employee benefits. It's a, it's a company called Personal Group. Uh, it's listed on the AIM market, and we go into very large companies um, uh, like bus companies, logistics businesses, catering businesses, uh, and we um, put in uh, vo- voluntary benefit um, schemes which give employees discounted rates on um, uh, gym membership, on lifestyle uh, uh, things like, uh, like 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 holidays, etc., and we also have some uh, simple healthcare insurance products there, which we insure ourselves. It's a very a very uh, interesting, rather niche, um, but highly profitable and successful business. So I've, I'm 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 chairman of that. Uh, I'm a non-exec director, as I think you've already said, of Bristol Water. Uh, I'm involved with a technology startup business in London, which is. Uh, uh, digitizing coupons so instead of having a, a piece of paper that says 4p off personal you'll be able to go into the supermarket and uh, and it will all appear in in in, in your smartphone in a, in a wonderful way um and and so that is my um my my paid work and then i determined when i left osborne clark uh 10 years ago that i would spend half my life working in the voluntary sector uh and so i am the chairman of the cycling and walking uh charity sustrans Uh, I have been chairman of the biodiversity conservation charity Wild Screen, which takes Bristol's position as the uh, wildlife and natural history film capital of the world. And uh, it's a sort of shop window, if you like, for that. So we have the most important trade fair in the world in this genre, which takes place in Bristol every two years. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, on the Council of Bristol University. Uh, and with the Environmental Institute there, which is called the Cabot Institute. Um, And uh, more recently, through my Merchant Venturer connection, I've been chairman of the governors of the Academy School uh, in Withywood, which is called Merchants Academy. Crikey, quite a lot, actually. Uh, Let's just talk about Bristol Water, because it's been in the news today, the national news, Bristol Water, as actually getting its knuckles wrapped as the worst company, uh, water company in the country, if you're looking at uh, overcharging, because you've been ordered at Bristol Water to cut bills by 21% over the next five years. I looked at the off what um, press release, and they're basically saying, and I I don't know if you'd agree with me, but they're saying that what you've been doing is uh, at Bristol Water is shifting costs from the big clients and the wholesale market in water onto individuals and households Uh, and so you're going to have to do the opposite shift them back again and that means that you're going to have to be taking quite a lot off of everybody's individual water bills at Bristol Water Uh, it's not great is it to be pointed to by off what as the the uh, water company that's overcharging the most and going to have to cut your rates the most out of anywhere in the country Uh, well the first thing I, I, I would say is that I'm not a spokesman for Bristol Water um, and uh, th- th- uh, therefore I'm, I'm um, going to be limited in what, what I'm willing to say about this. Uh, however, uh, I think that your description uh, of, uh, of, of what you're saying off what has said is, a, is, a, is a, um, a, at best a distortion and at worst um, something um, very considerably different from that. W- what I would say is this, that the, um, that the prices... Uh, that the water companies, like any other utility, can charge, are fixed every five years, and this is what is happening now. 
the prices were fixed through the regulatory, the same regulatory system five years ago. So to suggest that we, we have been overcharging for the last five years, which is not what Ofwat have done, um, is, 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 is simply not right. What, however, fundamentally the point is, is this, that there is a balance that has to be struck between what customers pay and the level of service and the resilience of the distribution network, the pipes and the mains and, and, and the treatment works and the reservoirs and all the rest of it. And there's a balance to be struck between what customers pay and, and the level of service and resilience and the need to maintain uh, a, an appropriate level of resilience uh, uh, of the system. And uh, in the course of the preparation of our business plan uh, over the last uh, two years and more, we have worked very, very closely indeed with a customer group that has been drawn widely across our customer base. It includes uh, representatives from um, organisations like Citizen Advice Bureau uh, and the Consumer Council for Water, local authority, councillors, etc. And they uh, approved our plan unanimously. They have been very supportive of our plan. Uh, and in surveys more widely uh, across our customer base, we have had 92% approval and acceptance uh, of our plan. And so, in a sense, we have here a, a pretty significant disconnect um, between uh, what we, uh, supported by our customers uh, uh, through their representatives, uh, feel is appropriate uh, for the next five years, and what off what, who apply a consistent um, uh, financing model uh, across the industry, which benefits some companies and, 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 and uh, does the opposite uh, for other companies, what they say we should be charging. So you're saying off what's got it wrong? Uh, we, we are, uh, what I am saying is that uh, our plan was put together uh, with strong approval from our customers, and not only that, but uh, having had uh, civil engineers and uh, accountants and uh, professionals of all sites and uh, types and persuasions uh, looking at our at our plans, looking at our costings, uh, and uh, giving us the uh, comfort that we what we submitted uh, has been a sound and appropriate business plan. Yeah, interesting that they should just come out today. I wonder what your thoughts are about whether you think it's appropriate to be running um, uh, things like these utilities like water as a private business or whether you think it would be better run uh, as, a, as the old water boards used to be in state hands because essentially you know, those days uh, and those ways of doing things were done for a reason and that was that, uh, that, that water should be supplied to people at cost and, and what it seems here is that in any private business there's bound to be payments made to shareholders or to staff and it's going to be more expensive in the private sector so why not just go back to the old system where water's being supplied to people at cost? Well, because if you look at the state of the, just to take the water um, uh, industry, if you look at the state of the water industry as it was immediately before privatisation uh, and the state it, that it's in today, it is in an immeasurably stronger condition, by which I mean that the, that the resilience, the reliability, the quality of, of, of service... Um, and uh, reflected, of course, by the huge amount of capital that has been invested since privatisation uh, in the infrastructure of the water industry, uh, that the, 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 uh, the, 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 the customers who, who benefit uh, from the water industry have, um, uh, have benefited enormously from privatisation. And let's not remember that uh, where you talk about the uh, level of profit uh, that is available to uh, to shareholders, that level of profit is itself uh, stipulated by Ofwat, and uh, so that is that is uh, the um, uh, in, in, in the overall mix uh, when Ofwat sets its prices. But what about uh, I mean, as, as, is it a uh, is, I think it's a PLC, isn't it, Bristol Water? But it doesn't. I don't think you can get shares on the open market, can you? So who are your shareholders? Well. It was a public company when I first became a director. Uh, it was a, it was a public company uh, with uh, with with many shareholders. It was then the subject of a of a, of a takeover bid, um, and uh, it, it, yes, it is it is rather rather strange on the on the surface uh, that our shareholders now are 
uh, a Canadian infrastructure fund, <laughs> right. uh, a, 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 a Spanish water company, uh, and uh, even a, a Japanese um, uh, conglomerate has a has a small shareholding. But uh, the I have to say that that uh, as, as and I speak as one of the independent non-executive directors, of whom there are three. Uh, the, the 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 shareholders uh, are a if you like a beneficent group of shareholders they they uh, they they uh, have concerns uh, particularly for the uh, the standards of, and, and and levels of service that we offer uh, and of course they, uh, they 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 need to make their return on capital um, but uh, if you think that the board meetings are uh, are, are, are dominated by discussion of shareholder interests, you could not be further from the truth. But, I mean, surely there's pressure on you uh, around the board table at Bristol Water to be thinking, well, hang on a minute, um, we better uh, make sure that we keep the shareholders happy. And the customers, ordinary people like us, like me, <laughs> Martin and everybody... And me, uh, uh, and, and, you, and, and you. me. Surely, and I am, surely I... they come secondary, don't no, they? No, 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 Ab- absolutely not. Um, it, that, 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 no, that, that, that is absolutely not the case. And that is why uh, the water companies all have independent non-executive directors like me. But what I'm saying is that the, that the job which the three independent non-executives uh, have on the board of Bristol Water uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, protecting and ensuring that the rights of the customer are protected. That is not a difficult uh, role for us to discharge uh, because the shareholders understand very well uh, that, the, that the position of the customer is paramount. Well, let's hope they do. Uh, they do. Well, I can assure you, I can absolutely assure you they do. Yeah, because, I mean, for example, if the uh, customer can't afford to pay the bills, then the shareholder's going to have to take a, a hit, aren't they? And, and, and there are um, uh, extensive arrangements in place uh, for dealing with exactly that eventuality. So I mean, we know, we know that, uh, that, that, that some customers are, uh, have difficulty paying, and where there are genuine cases of customers... Uh, who, who are genuinely unable to pay, as opposed to people who simply don't pay for, for whatever reason. Uh, there are support mechanisms, and I mentioned just now the Citizens Advice Bureau, that is one of the mechanisms uh, which um, are, are deployed th- with funding support from the company to assist those very people. So you're not in favour of going back to a water board? Um, uh, I, I, I no, I don't. No, I'm not because I'm saying that the that the that the capital that has been invested since privatisation uh, and the ongoing requirements. I, I think I'm right in saying that the figure for the next five years is 44 billion pounds uh, that will need to be uh, invested in the next five years. Um, it, it, that that sort of money can only come from private sources. And can we and you look forward to a 21 percent cut in our water bills? Uh, uh, that remains to be seen, uh, but uh, clearly, uh, I- I- in the course of the coming weeks, uh, the company will need to consider uh, whether uh, an appeal uh, uh, is appropriate. Well, we'll wait and see. Um, old LA Broxford economist Martin Summers, what are your thoughts about this? Because uh, in a way, it's one of the most fundamental of all the privatisations over the decades has been water. Uh, do you think it's worked? Well, I mean, I'm ideologically opposed to private private water, so uh, therefore we're on opposite sides of the fence there. But it, it, there's no point picking that up in in one on one sense. It is a private company. That's how it's being run. Uh, I did find it very strange, though. For example, in Wessex Water, it turned out that they'd been bought out by Enron, who were actually turned out to be a you know a non company invented by by geeks in in Texas. And that's you know when what we're talking about here is you know water in the West Country, and it's suddenly we're bound we we we're, we're found ourselves caught up in all of that sort of thing um, and of course we do have an alternative model in in scotland for example the water boards still exist it's scottish water owned by owned by the people of scotland and of course the other thing is that when when the privatizations took place birmingham city council weren't very happy because they'd created their own water infrastructure which were then absorbed into the nationalized water industry and then privatized and Br- 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 birmingham city council saying hang on a minute that's our Water bo- that's how we created that. I mean, a lot of utilities historically were created by the entrepreneurialism of municipal uh, uh, elected officials, not through individual um, 
uh, um, entrepreneurialism. So Chamberlain, who used to run at Birmingham, created the, the gas utility and the water boards and so on. And, it, and he did it as, as a public... Uh, enterprise rather than as a private enterprise. But anyway, th- those are, are, are But actually, the Bri- Bristol, Bristol Water, um, in the, going back to the 1840s and 1850s, that was uh, uh, created originally by a set of uh, private entrepreneurs. Yeah, but I mean, th- th- there's a different history so, in each case, yeah, isn't indeed. there? I thought it was created by the monks back in uh, medieval times with their conduits bringing the water into the city centre. Ah, well, that's uh, that. That is absolutely right. I don't think it was the uh, I don't think it was the monks so much as uh, Sir Robert de Barclay, uh, who um, who who owned uh, the the estates around here. And um, you're probably aware that there is the original source of clean water uh, into Bristol came down from Noel. Uh, and, of all places, uh, and of all places, and even and even today, there is a pipe, and the and the the signs above ground of the pipe that runs from uh, a source in Knoll uh, into a well uh, beside St Mary Redcliffe Church. And then it's also St John's Conduit, and I noticed a couple of years ago, in fact, that had been running for 700 years, and I was horrified to see there was some Bristol Water Works going on in the city centre, at which point the uh, conduit stopped working, and it's never worked since. So uh, I'm not saying definitely that was your Bristol Water Company that stopped it, but it had been going for 700 years beforehand. Um, don't you think we should have a look at that, at getting that back going again? Well, I don't know about that one, but what I can tell you is this, that um, in, in relation to the pipe that comes down from Knoll and goes into, uh, into a, a, a well, a sink at, at St Mary Redcliffe, uh, it goes through Bedminster. And uh, during the war, some bomb damage uh, was caused in Bedminster to, to the pipe. Uh, and um, our people at Bristol Water, on a voluntary basis, have been uh, looking at uh, the damage caused there and um, have, have been taking action about it. So, um, yeah, we're doing something about that. Over in Ireland, in Dublin this week, we've had uh, one of the biggest pr- uh, protests for years uh, over water um, because they're having to pay for water for the first time in Ireland. Um, for for you, I mean, this is a it must, you must be looking across the Irish Sea, thinking, "Crikey!" Well, we hope we don't have that sort of protest against our charging for water over here, because I mean, in a way, we are looking at water as a sort of natural resource and as something which, well, the Irish people certainly think they should never have to pay for. No, but the, what my understanding is that the Irish uh, have um, understood and, and presumably been told for um, generations that the the cost of their water is part of their overall taxes. And that they are therefore paying for their water through the through the through their taxation. Well, we could do that here, surely. Well, you could do, but uh, but but that that is not the system that is uh, is is adopted in this country. Martin, don't you think it makes sense to take some of these very basic fundamental requirements that everybody needs, the poor and the rich alike? And to deliver them uh, to the public through taxation, isn't that what? Well, I mean, I, 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 I would obviously argue that as, as a socialist, but I mean, it, it, water is becoming a very sensitive issue all over the world. The attempts to privatise water in Bolivia, for example, in La Paz, caused a massive social uprising, and they were actually trying to say to people, "You must buy water from the privatised water company. We won't even let you collect rainwater." So they're going around kicking over people. I don't think we're quite like that here. No, but and also in Detroit, there's big protests at the minute of people, poor people, being cut off their water supplies and you know water is a rather special um, I mean we all need a certain amount of water every day we're not talking here about a, some, a choice that consumers can choose to have or not to have we all need it and of course that's the reason why there's a strong public interest in this industry whether it's in public or private hands it's got to be regulated as you've rightly said you can't you can't you just, it's not just a free-for-all is it no absolutely not um, but uh, the fact is that uh, it is very, very easy to take um, the provision of clean water coming through your tap every day for granted. Oh. And the price which is paid uh, by customers for, uh, for, 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 the, for the water coming through the tap every day uh, is a very, very modest level in comparison with costs of, uh, of, of other drinks and, and indeed other utilities. 
the, the most, I think, probably we've been talking about water for a long, long time around this table. But there's one other uh, way we have, and that's through fracking. What's your thoughts about that, Chris? As someone that sits around the board table at Bristol Water, we've heard that, um, that fracking in other parts of the world, certainly in other parts of uh, in, in the United States and, and Australia, etc., has actually adversely affected our water supplies. Is that yes. something you're worried about? Yeah, it's that, that is something I'm, um, I am worried about. I suppose when I think about fracking, uh, I tend to put on my... My sustrans and my environmental hat uh, and uh, fracking is being portrayed uh, as uh, a potentially wonderful solution to all sorts of our economic problems um, but we have we must remember that fracking involves the um, the use of a fossil fuels fracking is a, is a is a is a producer of fossil fuels and and anything that is uh, contributing to the uh, burning of fossil fuels in my book is a bad thing. Well, I'm also thinking about the injection of chemicals into the aquifers uh, absolutely. In, and in the Mendips, for example. And I know you, for example, you've got a reservoir at Cheddar. Yep, yep. No, that, I mean, we are we are very concerned about that. And you may possibly be aware that that um, there was a, a, an issue not very long ago involving a quarry at Stowey, uh, where uh, there was there was a planning application into. Um, uh, to to to, to uh, dump toxic waste in the, in this um, in this quarry, uh, which was above the Chew Valley Reservoir, and and Bristol Water were quite rightly very concerned about that, uh, and w- I, I, I'm sure that we would have similar concerns in relation to fracking. Okay, back to the Merchant Venturers now. Uh, Chris Curling's joining me, who's the new, um, just installed last month, Master of the Merchants. Uh, what is your role as Master? What do you do? Um, as master, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm um, the, 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 the lead custodian of the, uh, of the activities, if you like, of the, of the society. I'm, I'm the principal spokesperson and, and the principal representative. So uh, I, uh, I, I, I attend quite a lot of different functions. But, but most particularly of all, I am concerned uh, to make sure that the range of activities which we carry on in the community uh, are, are, are being... Um, uh, properly and fully discharged uh, and that uh, where there is opportunity to do more uh, we have, can evaluate those opportunities and 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 uh, I, I want to make the most of the of the resources that we have particularly the human resources that we have um, in order to be able to discharge to the greatest benefit possible uh, the various things that we do and I, I have a particular interest in in two aspects one is Communications. I think it is fair to say that the society, uh, although it is, um, it's, it's opened itself up enormously in in the last um, eight or ten years, and is a very, in a very different place. It's a very different organisation from what it is ten years ago. Nevertheless, it perhaps has um, uh, has not been uh, as uh, open and communicative about the activities that it engages in as it should have been. Now, there's a very good reason for that, and that is that there has been a, an approach to date, which I think is very laudable, uh, which says that uh, we should be concentrating all our firepower and all our resources on the activities that we do, rather than explaining to the community uh, around us uh, what it is that we are doing. And I think that the, that the time has now come when we need to just spend a bit of resource uh, in, in explaining to the uh, world outside what we're doing, which is actually why I'm delighted to have been asked to come on this programme. Great. Well, maybe again sometime, Chris, because, I mean, when you're talking about communications, obviously the big problem that you've got from a PR point of view is the links to the slave trade. Um, and I was on the board of the Bristol Cultural Development Partnership up in the run-up to 2007 and 2008 and the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade. Um, and I, I just felt at the time, through seeing the surveys that were do- being done around the city about people's uh, consciousness of the slave trade and slavery generally, um, the one thing that kept coming back was that, uh, that uh, particularly the Afro-Caribbean community, but many people uh, in St Paul's and other people in the um, uh, black minority ethnic community wanted to see some kind of permanent memorial in the city, whether it be a museum or something like that, which uh, which was not necessarily um, something created by the merchant ventures, which which but which the merchant ventures were behind, uh, that would put a, put a, I suppose an end to the um, the speculation, if you want, that the merchant ventures aren't taking their those historical problems seriously. Uh, and I just wonder what you think about that, because it, nothing seems to have happened. And there's various uh, 
uh, nobody's basically come up with any money to do it i suppose that's why or a space to do it in and i'm sure the city council would uh, would help find somewhere but is that something you're in favor of having some sort of permanent um re- uh, i suppose museum looking at some of the uh, the warts and all at some of the um uh, crimes really what we can look back on now because it wasn't a crime at the time but uh, quite clearly morally it was a crime uh, to be involved in that trade and it's something where previous merchants uh, in previous generations actually did rather well out of it. Yes, I, I, I might take you back to your very introduction at the beginning of this program because um, you uh, were, were, were seem to be saying two things. First of all, that the society itself benefited enormously from slavery. That, that is not true. The society did not engage in slavery, it, although uh, it, it, some, some, maybe many, I don't know, but certainly some of its members did engage in slavery and would have benefited. But the key thing is that they were not the only people in Bristol uh, who benefited from it, and that's the other the other uh, issue that uh, that that, that uh, I think you got wrong, in, if I might say so, in your introduction. It is it is wrong to focus the slave trade only. Uh, on people who were merchant venturers, and that is because Bristol people, uh, much more widely than just the merchant venturers, uh, were involved in the slave well, trade. Well, to be fair, Chris, and, I haven't actually said that. I mean, what I'm focusing on is, is Edward Coulston specifically. That's what we were focusing on, and he was a merchant venturer, and he was a slave trader. Uh, yes, he was, um, and and um, I, I would repeat what I said earlier, that, um, that, that, that nobody in their right minds today... Uh, would regard uh, the uh, slavery historically and indeed modern slavery as anything other than completely abhorrent. Of course, Edward Colston was also uh, arguably Bristol's greatest benefactor in terms of the amount of money that he uh, he, he, he put into uh, the, the, the Bristol community. Um, and uh, f- many people... Um, over the last two or three hundred years, have benefited considerably from that. But in a way, I'm not saying way, I'm not. I'm, uh, that is not to say that uh, I would regard Edward Colston uh, as, as 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 having been uh, a man of of, of unblemished character. But, we're, we're but, the but let me let, let me oh. just repeat again to get the context right. At that time. Slavery was legal, was legal, and it yeah. was not regarded as, as immoral. But it's also quite legal now to have investments in arms companies, isn't it? Yes, so it is. Don't you think that maybe uh, maybe it's, it would be helpful for the society to be more open about where it has its investments? Where, you know, it's, it's certainly spending money in the city through charitable means, which is very laudable. But don't you think there are questions about where that money's coming from? Um, uh, frankly, uh, I would regard that as an absolute sideshow. I think what is much more important is the fact that we are managing investments which are uh, producing income, which is coming into the, in, 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 into the community across a very wide piece. Are you doing well out of the financial crisis? as uh, investors because what's happening is the quantity of easing money seems to be finding its way into the uh, stocks and shares investment markets but not finding its way into the real world so it's it's actually quite good for big investors like yourselves you're asking whether whether we've done well out of the financial crisis i think that uh, in common with um, with many other investors uh, we've um, we've had our ups and we've had our downs in the in uh, uh, over the period um I, I don't. I don't see that that is a, a question that is particularly relevant, frankly, to um, to, to to what we're up to in, in terms of our community work uh, in in this current day and age. But most of that QE money does go into stocks and shares and asset prices and things like that, doesn't it? Um, it goes into all sorts of places, but uh, that that may be the case. Yes. What about your Latin motto in Porperium Patti? Um, what does that mean? And I mean, because uh, certainly when I put it into, uh, first of all, looked it up in my uh, my uh, Latin dictionary, it says the poor are stupid and long suffering. What, yes. what, what's your translation of it? Because um, that's what my Latin dictionary well, says, well, and what a computer Latin okay. dictionary told me. Well, first of all, you 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 haven't quoted the uh, the the the, uh, the Latin correctly. It's oh, in, not, sorry. You, you should have added the word indoculus uh, in in at the front of it. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. And uh, th- th- that is apparently taken from some ode of Horace, who was a, a, a Latin poet. Um, who, and who what is it, that? What, sorry, Horace. Oh, Horace. Yeah. And what it what it translates as uh, is. It is intolerable to allow poverty, and what that is about is um, uh, the philanthropic uh, work uh, of the society, which is about the relief of poverty. And do you think you're succeeding? 
Well, it's a, we've got one hell of a task, uh, and all I can tell you is that we've got 75 pretty, pretty can-do people who are working uh, very, very hard across the, uh, the range of, uh, of, of, of community areas that I've talked about. OK, uh, thanks very much. That's Chris Curling, Master of the Merchant Ventures, uh, talking to us there. We're back online. this week. You'll find this show online at www.thisweek.org.uk. I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a very good week, and don't let the banksters get you down. Bringing you national news on the hour. Live from the Sky News Centre. From the Sky News Centre at 7, dozens of flights have been cancelled and many others delayed after a technical failure at the headquarters of air traffic control company Nats in Hampshire. For a time, there were no flights able to take off or land at some UK airports, but the problem was resolved by around 4pm. Transport Secretary Patrick McLaughlin says the disruption was unacceptable. Martin Rolfe from the National Air Traffic Control Service insists they responded quickly. Obviously we apologise to any passenger that's been disrupted and obviously our customers in, for, in the form of the airlines and the airports as well. But from our perspective we're now back up and running working very closely with our partners, the airlines and the airports to make sure that the entire system can get up and, and back to normal as fast as is humanly possible. Ministers have been warned urgent actions needed to get the NHS through the winter after waiting times in A&E in England hit record levels. Figures for the first week of December show more than 35,000 people waited more than four hours for treatment. UKIP isn't commenting on reports it's getting £300,000 donation from newspaper proprietor uh, Richard Desmond. The owner of the Express, Star and several magazines is believed to have met Nigel Farage earlier this month. It's claimed uh, lightning has struck 5,000 times across the Western Isles and northern Scotland in this